Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, Andrew Friskop, Assistant Professor and Extension Pathologist, North Dakota State University. Andrew received his PhD in plant pathology from North Dakota State University. In 2013, he became NDSU Serial Crop Extension Plant Pathologist and has developed an extension-driven research program on economically important serial diseases. His current research focuses on developing management strategies for Fusarium head blight, stripe rust, and fungal leaf spots on small grains. So with that, Andrew. Well, thank you. Uh, did you write that introduction? Is that you? Oh, okay. Anyway, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, a little bit liveliness. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, there we go. So let's talk about scab, right? So we had a great introduction to it. And really, my goal this presentation is I'm going to focus on some of the research I've been doing at NDSU. So it's going to be a lot of fungicide and varieties. I guess no secret there. But more or less kind of tell the story of uh, why we, we're so worried about it and some of the things that we uh, take care of for management. So I, I always have to start with my Kodak moment. I take a lot of photos of scab, one of the easier things to photograph during the year. And uh, on a year-on, year-on basis, this is going to be our number one disease. It was our number one disease in 1993 during the epidemic years, and since I've started, it continues to be our number one disease. So that is no, that is no secret to that. So the question is, what does it look like on a year-to-year -year basis? My worst scab year in North Dakota was in 2016. Mirrors pretty much as far as I would think the last couple of years up here in Manitoba as well. So let's, let's fast forward here. What did 2018 look like in the state? And I guess my, my comments is when, they, when I always get asked about scab risk of last year, I said it was consistent but not an epidemic. And really, I want to kind of show this through pictures. So uh, in North Dakota, we have a couple different forecasting models for scab. One is based out of a national center uh, out in the East Coast, and we also have a state model. And pretty much, it's a very visual. Uh, the more yellow and more red you get, the greater scab risk, okay? So what I'm going to show you here is our scab risk for June 20th, 2018. Looks pretty clean, right? And I'm going to take you through more or less these week-by-week -week progressions. So starting a week after the 20th until the 27th, we kind of see this scab risk start developing in southwest North Dakota. And as we get to the 4th of July, you kind of see it move across the state, the scab risk. And then when we got to the middle of July, we had quite a bit of scab risk. So the question is, why did we have a lower type of scab last year? Well, for once in my lifetime, I can say that we were heading at the right time and not at the wrong time, oftentimes when I think about scab epidemics. And if I had to put that picture up one more time, if I, had to, if I had to highlight an area of the state that we had our worst scab epidemic, I'd go to the southeast corner. Um, this area of the state right now, really heavy corn, soybean, sugar beet type of area, but uh, with some of the market prices, uh, wheat is starting to become a popular uh, variety back in the rotation. So the question I get is, why was this corner of the state so much more uh, susceptible? And, of course, I can always blame Mother Nature. As a plant pathologist, I say, yeah, it's the weather. That's pretty much what I say. But the one thing, and maybe this is a failure on my job, is we had an acreage increase in our most susceptible variety in the state. So I guess there's a little bit of uh, education I get to do over again in kind of the closest area to Fargo. But I mean, the same story is it just kind of paints a picture of why you know, selecting a resistant variety and the impact. And even in a low scab year, I had growers that were looking at 20% yield loss and dawn levels exceeding four parts per million. So that, that, that's, that's more or less what I think about from 2018. So the, the title of the talk is management. And I, you know, I could dissect these and why they're each important and why we need to follow them from a year in and year out. But really, I'm just going to spend most of the time on the last three. As always, as was mentioned, an integrated approach, that's our best management. This includes cultural practices, crop rotation. One of the oldest plant disease principles we have available to us is still valuable. Breaking up, you know, avoiding uh, small grain on small grain, uh, wheat on corn, avoiding those, and really incorporating a broadleaf. Uh, other cultural practices, um, we talked about planting dates. Uh, having a couple different planting dates, you, just, uh, you don't put all your eggs in that same heading risk uh, type of basket. But really, when we look at it from what we can likely determine on a year in and year out is less susceptible varieties and in the fungicide game, what to use 
and when to use it. So if I want to start with varieties, what I'm just showing you is I just listed our top spring wheat varieties by acreage of last year and really don't pay so much attention to the variety listed, but look at the Fraserium head blight ratings. So in our state, uh, we do a scale. It's a one to nine scale, one being the most resistant, nine being the most susceptible. And most of the time, we're going we're gonna to have varieties, what I call middle of the road, maybe trending towards some of our best variety. A worst spring wheat variety in the state right now is scored an eight, and that was the same variety that was in southeast North Dakota last year. So, I mean, uh, you just still have these regional differences, but I mean, the good thing is when I look at my spring wheat growers, I say we have a very effective tool, and that is based on some of the breeding that's come along both in the, the private and uh, public sectors we have in the state. So what about Durham? Any Durham growers? Anybody that doesn't want to admit to be a Durham grower after 2016? Oh, okay. Um, much different game. Uh, you know, based off the scale that we use at NDSU, uh, I, I'd say we're a little generous. I, I always say that anything you consider your best Durham variety that we have available, that's probably towards the end of the scale on the spring wheat scale. So that's just something that paints a picture is when it comes to the role of host resistance, you know, not alone know what you grow in the different regions uh, uh, based on your production, but also knowing that there is a big difference between Durham and spring wheat and the type of resistance that's available in there. So that, that's more or less my short and sweet on varieties. I, I didn't want to get into what genes we have and how they're developed. It's more like we have tools in progress and that is what we use. Most of my time is spent on this word and this is fungicides. And a lot of it comes down to, like I said, what to use and when to use it. And some of the other questions that have been kind of dovetailed off over the last couple of years. So in a very general historic perspective of fungicides, let's look at fungicide choice. And what I'm going to show you is what I call kind of my gradation of what can we expect from a fungicide for scab. So this is a bluff, that's bluff in Nebraska. And pretty, pretty much what this looks at is if we're looking at a fungicide, and if I'm applying it, I want 100% control, right? That, that is really where I want to live. And in some cases with foliar diseases, I think we can do that. So where does scab rank in that? Well, the first thing about fungicides, right now we only have one chemistry that, is, uh, that provides any type of relief to scab, and that is the triazoles, FRAC3. The ones that we have available um, that has been tested over hundreds of trials over a decade of years, and more or less these are percentages and how much it reduces scab. Tilt is around general rindle 12 to 20 percent, and I would often say this falls closer to that 12 percent. Uh, when you look at your folic here and the generic formulations that may, may or not be out there in tebiconazole, uh, we're looking at about a 30 percent. And our most effective fungicides, Corumba and Prosaro, range is 45 to 60 percent. So when, when I look at this on a general basis, if I, would, if I would do these trials year on and year out, which we end up doing, this is pretty much what I can expect from the performance of the fungicides we have on the market. Uh, but the key thing is, the reason why these are labeled is because these are the ones that are useful. The reason why I say that is in the U.S. right now, uh, we've uh, there are some misapplications of using a QOI or FRAC 11, uh, the headline, the quadruses of the world, uh, for scab management. And the problem with that is that can actually increase your DON levels. And although we've known this t since 2000 and 2001, sometimes on the east coast of the U.S., we start to run into some problems with that. And to just kind of help paint a picture, uh, this was presented at a forum, the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative, which is a, a federally funded program to help manage this disease. Uh, federal dollars put into this program. The, here they're just more or less looking at the types of application of QOIs versus the top three triazole products. I'm going to enlarge this for you. And really what I'm looking at is anytime you see a negative bar, that actually is either increasing disease or increasing DON. In other words, this is, this is why you will not find a headline or quadrus being labeled for any type of scab management. Although it might be very, very uh, obvious to a lot of us in here, but this is something that I'm still facing a little bit, is just the awareness of what are you applying and the reason why we apply triazoles right now. Okay, what about fungicide timing? It was a great lead-in because I'm going to have some very, very complimentary data sets here, so I, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that. 
So when I think about fungicide timing, I'm going to break it down by the three small grains I deal with most, uh, spring barley, uh, spring wheat, and then uh, durum. So the first one I'm going to speak on is barley. So it, I, I use a feek scale, but for the more, more or less is what I'm going to call this as full head application, okay? When you have a full spike out for barley, that is generally what the recommendation is. And what I'm showing you is kind of the range of heading that can, that can occur at the same, at, during a given time. So what does it look like from an application at this time? So I'm going to show you a data set we had in Fargo. And almost all my disease data that I'm going to show you is all pertaining to DOM levels, because that's usually what resonates with the growers in North Dakota the most. And in this first trial, I'm looking at a non-treated check at 1.8 parts per million. So that was no treatment, susceptible variety, nothing sprayed on it. So what was the application of a carumba, prosaro, and mussels, a full cure more or less? You kind of see that relationship. Remember I said right away in the historical context, 50, 60 percent from prosaro and carumba, maybe about 30 percent for fuller cure. So what about this late timing, meaning that you couldn't get out there and you had to go out there a couple days later. In this case, there's five days after. We're starting to see what I call this back window of the application starting to open up, meaning that we're still getting scab suppression, but we're also being able to preserve some of that yield as well. So let's switch crops. So let's look at spring wheat. So optimal timing for spring wheat, when you start seeing those yellow anthers, and I always say on most of the heads, just because I'm all too familiar that you may have six, seven different growth stages going on at the field at the same time, target as many heads that are flowering. And that's how I put in logistics. What do we see from these same different types of timing of application? This time, I want to show you the role of host resistance. Uh, this is across four trials done up at uh, uh, up in northeast and around the Fargo area. Uh, Don level starting at six parts per million for a susceptible and 1.4 for a mile resistant. Already you're able to get over that eight ball more or less and be, instead of setting yourself back. So what does a prosaro application look like, look like either at flowering or a prosaro application when would it call being a little too late? Once again, like I said, over the last couple of years, we're starting to see that dawn suppression hold on the back end. Uh, regardless of the varietal performance, that fungicide is starting to really show as far as what we would expect from, from efficacy. All right, so let's look at one more crop. Let's look at Durham. Still one of my favorite crops to work with. Um, once again, you know, timing is still looking at those yellow flowers. So when you think of it, spring wheat, very, pretty similar as far as the, the, the visual cues for it you're going to see a same story. Now, this was done in two years. As you can see, we had some extremely high dawn levels. Uh, this was an inoculated trial in misted. Really going to test the performance of that variety and also uh, the fungicide. But as I said, when, I've been, when I'm speaking for the last five years, is when I think about fungicide application, I was told in my career right when I started that you have two days to make that application. And I, I guess when I hit the ground running, I would argue that we have maybe we almost have a week now to make an application, which is huge because there's so many factors that can come into play, especially when you start throwing around the Mother Nature curveball. All right, so that was the old. So what have we been doing recently? And more or less the, the, the last couple projects that we've been focusing on, one is some of the questions we got from growers is what is the value of applying a fungicide twice? in that flowing process, can we ever get any more control of Dawn uh, for, the, for, uh, for when we're out there? And this last year, we have a new fungicide, Miravis Ace, that's going to be labeled in the U.S., and I think the Canada label is 2021, somewhere on there. Uh, but I just want to give you kind of a snapshot on why it's going to be a little bit different when you think about scab management. So here's my scab fighting team in the state. Uh, I expanded to six locations, run about 14 to 15 trials, all at uh, uh, the research extension centers placed across the state. And all this is done with the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative funding. And each year I pretty much twist their arms to always save a little bit more space for me because I always have more treatments I want to add. And uh, without their help, I don't, there's no way we'd be able to turn around some of this data so quickly, especially on the fungicide game where you need a lot of locations and environments. So the first question that we looked at in 2016 and 2017 was, what is the value of applying fungicide twice for SCAD? Don't think about the economics right now, but really just think about what was the type of control can you get from 
two fungicide applications during that heading process. So the first location I'm going to show you is in the central portion of our state, low disease environment and combined across two years. We're looking at a non-treated check of about 0.7 parts per million of Don. Not a lot of Don in there, uh, but more or less let's look at the role of some of these fungicide programs. First one is our recommended program, Prosaro at early flowering. See, you see that reduction in about 50%. Uh, that's pretty common uh, when, when I've been looking at these trials. And here we start looking at a couple combinations. One I call the non-economical one. But the reason why I threw it in there is because I want to know if I can ever get to 100% with fungicides. So this was Prosaro at our recommended time of early flowering and then coming four days later and spraying a full rate of Corumba after that. And you can see that we get a little bit more Don reduction, but it doesn't completely get rid of the problem. So what is something that was done, and I know a few growers in North Dakota do do this, uh, is coming with a full rate of crumba and then coming four days later with folic here. You kind of see that dual application as far as efficacy does reduce it more than a single application. Similarly, as you look at another one, uh, pretty much splitting up Prosaro into its two active ingredients, you see more or less a very similar trend. So what, what, is this, what does this tell me? Well, I think two applications do give us a little bit more Dawn suppression. Is it economical? Really, really tough to do that game. There's so many other factors that go into that. Uh, to look at this program in a more high disease situation to see what type of relative Dawn levels, here we're up in northeast North Dakota location, much higher level, higher level of Dawn at 7.3 parts per million. Prosaro reducing it down to about three parts per million. And here we start looking at those combination treatments get more reduction with a Prosaro followed by Corumba, and also with a Corumba followed by Folic here, and likewise. So what, what is this saying? Well, even in a low disease, and what I call high disease environments, we can get a little bit more suppression, but what I'm telling growers right now is if we have our chance to put down a fungicide at your best possible time, and the current status, what we're in, that's probably our best bet right now. But when if we start dealing with some higher market prices, and I know there's a few growers that will still do this as far as a year-on and year-out basis because they live by it. That's what they want to do. That's how they budget each year. Okay, so that was the two fungicide application. Now I'm going to talk about a new fungicide. The reason why I put a question mark on it is uh, they haven't found a non-triazole fungicide for scab that's been testing for the last 20, 25 years. So what is this new fungicide? Well, Syngenta has a product coming to, U to the U.S. next year called Miravis Ace. And what it is, is I'm just going to call it a Depidin. That's, that's, the, that's the trademark uh, active ingredient name on it. it is a FRAC7 SDHI, meaning that it is from a different mode of action. This has a no lot of novelty, and to aid, it piques my interest because different mode of action, might explore some more chemistries within that same same uh, frac group. And more importantly, we always think about fungicide stewardship and sustainability. This all plays well. So we've had a chance at NDSU to look at it for a couple years, and it wasn't until this last year we really ramped up our efforts to see is there timing differences, what is the level of efficacy, these common questions that we can kind of get ahead of the game before we go into the 2019 season uh, when growers are looking to maybe apply in some of this fungicide. So the first I looked at it was in 2017 in Fargo. Uh, I looked at it on Durham because it was a pretty hot topic at the time. Uh, here, my non-treated check was about uh, one and a half parts per million of Dawn. And I was just doing more or less side-by-side -side comparisons of Prosaro or Miravis Ace at three different timings. The first one at full head, so this is being too early, so to speak. Um, what type of Dawn suppression did we get? It looked pretty good. Uh, I'd say we got a little bit more suppression than I thought we would at that timing, but it was answering a question that it, it looked like a pretty effective fungicide. What about at the recommended time? Same type of story, still a pretty effective fungicide. Being too late, you kind of get my drift with this. Is that when, I, when we had a chance to look at it, I said, hey, we know it's going to be an effective fungicide, but I have to figure out some of these timing issues yet. When is, what is, what are, when is the best time to potentially apply Miravis Ace? The reason why I bring that up is next year on the label, it's going to be, I believe, you can apply as early as half head, meaning that we're even earlier than what we would ever expect. And that raises a few questions for me logistically, 
because if we're targeting main stems, if I know most of the main stems are at, we'll say, half head, a lot of those primary tillers aren't even out yet. And I know a fungicide can only move a little bit and coverage is everything. So these are the type of answers that we were looking at this past year, just to kind of give you an idea of, you know, what, what was um, probably going to be on the label versus to what is currently recommended for SCAD. So what we did, as I said, with that big contingency of effort that we have across the state, is I'm going to share some of the data where we looked at more or less being too early, recommended time, or being a little bit too late. So this first trial I want to share with you on Durham. Here your non-treated was at 7.3 parts per million of Dawn. Miravis Ace versus Prasaro at half head kind of looked like that it looked pretty good at that early timing. Uh, so what does it compare to at our, our recurrent recommendation at early flowering? At this location, it was just as good as those other treatments statistically. So if I would take this and just run with this one location in one year, you know, I might be able to have a story. Um, but you'll see here as I share a few more data slides here is why it gets a little bit more gray. The other application that we added was also what I call the non-economical one of applying either Miravis Ace followed by Corumba or Pissarro just to see how low we could get that done. And the reason I'm throwing it up there is I can't get you zero. That's pretty much what the, some of those fungicide timings. So what about another, another location we looked at, uh, Miravis Ace? Here we have Pissarro at early flowering uh, versus Miravis Ace at half head or at early flowering. And in this trial specifically, it looked like the dawn levels seemed to be a little bit better at early flowering compared to at that half head application. So let's throw another location into this. Similar setup, looking at a couple different timings of Prasaro and Miravis Ace. Here we see the half head. I mean, although it is reducing dawn, it's you know, not nearly as much as if Miravis Ace was applied at the current recommendation. And comparatively to Prasaro, it just seemed like uh, it's better off right now as far as that timing thing is. I think we're still looking at an early flowering application. How I would spin this, though, is going back to logistics in the field. For some of those heads that aren't quite there yet, maybe just coming out of the boot stage, you might get a little bit more efficacy. Next year, we're going to run it on, I think, 14 or 15 trials in the state. Then we'll have about 30 trials of information to really own in as far as what we're looking at from the public side on, on the recommendation for a new funder side that's coming into the market. So what can I give you as kind of some of my final thoughts with Fusarium Head Blight Management? I'm always going to preach integrated management. Throw as many tools as you can at it as you, as you create your own strategy. But on the fungicide game, I think that fungicide application window is opening up. And similarly, what you were sharing with some of, the, some of the Manitoba data, I think that is pretty consistent right now. Uh, the two fungicide question, I think we can always have a little bit lower down levels with that. But the economics is something that is difficult to assess in that situation. And really what this new fungicide with Miravis Ace is, uh, we'll have a label next year. Uh, when I talk to Syngenta, it's gonna be coming to the Canadian market a few years after, and it's gonna be an effective fungicide for scab. One thing we're gonna own in on a little bit more is when, when is the best time to put it down? Uh, Cause that is gonna be the next question as soon as we uh, move forward with that. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, to the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative funding to do a lot of this research we have based in North Dakota. Uh, the research extension centers for more, more of my satellites or counterparts and my extension crew who uh, kind of handle the fort when I can drive around and give talks all winter. So with that, I'll take any questions, insight, comments, throw anything at me. I'm, re I'm ready for it. I see one up top, and there's another one there. Can you comment whoa, on the uh, type of application, like the nozzles you were using, the water volumes, and also uh, throw in the aircraft versus ground? Okay, so make sure I get this right. Speak on nozzle selection, water use, aircraft versus ground, anything that comes with the application process. Awesome, okay. So I, I didn't put that in here, but uh, we always recommend some type of angled o nozzle orientation, either forward, backward. Uh, you also have a new one that is a 70-30 offset. I can't quite remember the name of it off the top of my head right now. But the reason why we need that angled orientation is if we're dealing with a vertical target with a spike, 
we can't use gravity to our advantage. We need some type of angle drive in that. So all these trials are done with a flat fan, forward, backward facing nozzle. Uh, water use, in gen my general terms, is 10 to 20 gallons per acre. Um, I need conversions on that. Do I need conversions? No? Oh, perfect. Thank you. 10 to, gallon, 10 to 20 gallons per acre. Um, if, if you want to find the happy medium of 15, that, that works great. Uh, the question as far as aircraft versus a ground rig, um, my, my choice, if you have a chance to do it with your ground rig, I would do that. You can more or less kind of feel that you know, you're putting it out there. Aircraft works well too. It worked well in North Dakota, but really is that water use. Um, I always say ask for five gallons an acre when they're putting that fungicide out there. Uh, I know that can be a lot from an aerial dispersal type of you know, covering acres, but coverage is everything with a fungicide. You have a question right here, I think. Right? Okay, so the question pertains to um, next year, if we have a dry year, if we have a wet year, and how is that going to influence some of our scab risk? And I always say it's, it's, it's tough for me to know what's going to happen next year, but this is how I think about it each year when I think about scab. One, I know scab is more conducive with wet and relative humidity. Although we had a little bit drier year in some cases, that fusarium fungus is a survivalist. We're married to it, more or less, is what I like to equate it. So if we get the right conditions, we're likely to get scab. If we go through another dry year, probably not going to have to worry about it too much, but never go to sleep on this, because since 93, they've been funding this type of research, and you can almost see it. When you think that it's starting to go away, then it becomes a very big issue again. So when I, my game plan, when I think about next year's production season, knowing the value of a scab application, Think that you're going to have to apply it, but whether or not to pull that trigger is really determined if you're starting to see those long dew periods, high humidity throughout that heading to flowering process. Are you seeing any uh, reduction in efficacy of the existing fungicides as the fusarium evolves resistance? One more time. Are you seeing uh, the fusarium evolve resistance to the fungicides? Okay, so the question is often on a lot of ideas when you think about pests is what about resistance, right? Is we're going to have the fusarium fungus develop fungicide resistance. And the good thing is we're not in that situation with fusarium. The only isolate that they saw we call reduced sensitivity, meaning that it wasn't as effective, was pulled from an apple orchard from New York somewhere in a very isolated area. We've done some work just looking at screening isolates in North Dakota, and I'm not saying that we're the same, but we're pretty much the same as we get up into that northern tier. Uh, we're not seeing any type of issues right now, but not saying that it's not ever going to happen either. Have you noticed any difference in uh, scab levels when you use uh, different seeding rates and also any correlation to use of uh, plant growth regulators and scab levels? All right, so two, two questions. That's probably me. Um, I'll, I'll go this way maybe. Uh, uh, the two questions is any type of correlation or any type of relationship between seeding rates, so looking at plant population. The second one was looking at PGRs. Uh, we've done a few seeding rate studies uh, in, a, in a way to try to promote the amount of main stems so we can have a better fungicide application. Our problems with our small plot research, we haven't been able to uh, really, you know, our research objective to what we found, we haven't been able to bring that full circle. So I, in theory, I always say that it probably could help with the fungicide game. Um, also, when you think of it from the canopy, moisture retention, the denser the canopy, the better the environment. It's really tough to tell between production systems how that plays into it. Uh, and then the plant growth regulator work, honestly, we're looking at Manitoba right now for what you guys are finding. Uh, because the work that we started at NDSU, we haven't been able to find much. And we, we actually, uh, we were looking at some of those slides and like, those kind of look familiar and some of that data. So. I, I would rely on the PGR stuff up here. That's just, that's just kind of what we've been finding in the last couple of years. Got one more? Yeah? Okay. Oh, okay. We're still good? 
You can yell a question. I can repeat too. Just wondering if you any, did any testing with chemical at fungicide with chemical spraying, have rate at four, three, four leaf stage. So the question is to spray. applying chemical or a fungicide with your chemical with three, four leaf just to prevent scab or. Uh, so in other words, it comes to a fungicide timing is applying it before scab is likely to be there? Yep. Okay, so when we think about scab spores floating in the atmosphere, uh, the wheat crop is going to be susceptible from full head to soft dough. It's just most susceptible when you start seeing those flowers because that's what the fungus uses to get the food source. So the idea is if you apply early as a more of a preventative fashion, what does that do? Um, I, you still get efficacy. I don't think it's any more or any less in some cases, depending on the year. Uh, the one thing that I worry about if you go too early is you might miss complete coverage of the other spikes in those fields. So what I still look at is you still target that early flowering because in essence we're hitting most of those main stems, but the rest of the heads too, you're getting better coverage at that case. Yep. Oh, is he, is he gone? Uh, oh, yeah. So, so, the, so, so the question pertains to uh, the best time to apply is when you see flowers more or less on the head. And if you're... Sp it, yeah, so as you're moving through the field, your flowers are getting dispelled. Okay, and I wonder if that's too late. And no, so that, that's a perfect situation. So if you still have flowers, and of course they go from yellow to white, but if you still have flowers on those heads, you're still within that application window. And I, when I'm saying that if, if you're targeting early flowering, we're seeing that seven days after that, when you start seeing the white flowers starting uh, still remain on the head, that is kind of your application window right now as far as some of the research that we're seeing with fungicides. So that is, that's kind of the... Yeah so, so, yeah, so a lot of this goes into the uneven heading, heading in a field, and that's always an age-old question. Um, when is that best time for you? And that's why I always lay, rely back on if the more flowers you see, the better off. You're not, in those situations, there's probably no such thing as a perfect timing, but do one that you feel most comfortable with. Hi. I just wanted to pick up, you, you mentioned your your favorite cereals there being Durham and spring wheat and barley. Yeah, of course. And, and um, you know, barley with a very different type of flowering habit in that. I just wondered, do you see, um, like, do you have good data on terms of the types of fusarium uh, incidents that you get in barley crops in North Dakota? Is it similar to what you see with wheat or, or, do you, or is it different just because it is a different type of a, of a, a reproductive uh, cycle that it has. Sure. So the question kind of pertains to what type of scab instance we see in barley. Uh, barley has what we call a little bit of natural resistance, uh, meaning that you'll get infection on a floret, but it won't spread. So when you think of on, on a production level, you, m you might sometimes have a tough time picking up scabby barley. The problem is that when you're taking that to the multi-market, although you don't have a lot of scabby barley, it does not always mean you don't have a lot of dawn. In a lot of cases, we have see an inverse relationship where you see low incidence of scab and barley, but your dawn levels are way too high for a malting contract. So under general host resistance, there's just more natural resistance than barley. Could be due to the architecture, could be due to the flowering times, but still presents the same issue of the vomitox and that can, uh, that can start dealing with some of the quality aspects. I think I'm pulling me, That's yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, that was a good presentation.